<laughs> okay, first, oh, you're so cute, a whole lot of you, oh, uh, geez, I've been suffering through infrastructure hell in, in the past sort of 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, so what I want every, first of all, how many, like, children are there in the audience? I think you're safe. Good. I, can, I can say the F word then. Okay, I, I'm not saying I have to say the F word, but I'm going to be really tempted. Everything is so screwed up over here this afternoon. Needless to say, and, and I swear to God, I, I was about to step out the, the, the door of the pub over to the nice guy whose office with the broadband I'm in. And he said, you don't want to go out there. I said, Simon, I have to go out there. He says, it's raining. I said, my umbrella is in your office, Simon. He said, how wet can you not get in 30 meters? I'm like, I don't know. Anyway, so that's the story about that. Um, so needless to say, uh, Europe is a little screwed up today. All of it. <laughs> Half of it is, or no, excuse me, 90% um, of Europe is going, don't let the door hit you on the butt as you go out. <laughs> the other half of Europe, or the other, like, you know, the 10% of Europe is going, but we, we warned you we were going to do this. They're, they're saying, but you must have known, but, oh, God, I just want to slap somebody. <laughs> really. Politicians we knew were lying are actually coming out today and saying it. The guy who promised, God forbid I should mention names, the guy who promised that if the UK left the EU, that 350 million pounds worth of money that they were supposed to be spending every day would go to the National Health Service, he says, oh no, oh no, I was misquoted. <laughs> And so it's gone. The whole day has been like that. And, and it, it's like half of them, you know, are going, no, this is nothing to do with us. It's going to be fine. And the other half are going, no, the world is going to end. This is like a big meteor coming right at us. And I'm going, oh, <laughs> I need a wall. I, I, need, I would bash my head against that, except it's just, you know, a door and I, it wouldn't do me any good. <laughs> so. I'm sorry, you've caught, it's a very fraught kind of day. You know what I remember every time I say that word? I had an English teacher, and he was like sixth grade. And he hated when anyone would describe anything as being fraught. He had a thing against that word. He had a problem with it. And, you know, there are times when nothing else will work. You know, fraught. Sometimes fraught is fraught. Today is fraught. We are all fraught. <laughs> If that sums it up. And, and then Peter says to me, just as I'm leaving the pub, right, you need to, to top up the little broadband thing that we hang in the window. I said, fine, I'll do that when I get over in this broadband. And he says, okay, fine, go do that. And I get over here and, and I discover that that particular broadband dongle has never been topped up except with vouchers that you go into a shop to buy. So I have to, you know, like hook a credit card into it. Fine. We have, you know, debit cards. We can do that. And I put the numbers in and everything's fine. And it says, I'm sorry, I don't recognize that as a number from like Earth. You know, the infrastructure, it's tasking me today. It, it, it's like, I understand Ricardo Montalban's reading of that line. It tasks me, and I will have it. Oh, jeez. Anyway, we, Star Trek. We were going to be theoretically discussing the Star Trek. <laughs> Honestly, Diane, there is still... No whiskey. There is still no whiskey in this water. So <laughs> I missed that. All right. I had two glasses of wine while I was working, and then all the neighbors came in. And you can't work when the neighbors are in. God bless them. And it's Friday evening in the pub, and everyone's going. 
is this fucked or is it not? We're all going, yeah, yeah, it's fucked, you know. Um, they're, they're from Devolve numerous, surprisingly nuanced and intelligent discussions of what this is going to mean to Ireland. And all we can do is just kind of hold our heads and say, those dummies. <laughs> dummies was not actually the way the phrase ended. <laughs> okay. But God forbid I should, you know, say bad things about my neighbors. So, Star Trek. What about it? Um, today, you know, today is seen in the news has not been a great day for Star Trek either. As, you know, it's the old story about King Log and King Stork. Everything's fine until you pray the gods to send you a better king. You know, everything's fine until you make a ruckus and then suddenly you wake up and you discover that Paramount, which has been playing the sleeping giant for lo this long time now, and they've been very good, really very good for, for a big, big corporate copyright holder, you know, that brings in to its share shareholders every year the income of a small third world country, or maybe not so small. <laughs> And they've been really good, really good about not making a stink. And then, you know, they had no choice. It was brought to their attention, and now they had to sit up and they had to do something. Otherwise, they will, in the legal sense, be seen as not um, upholding their copyright. And they have to do that. Uh, otherwise, somebody is likely to come in and say, well, you weren't paying att any attention to that. So, you know, we're just going to run off with it now. And the chances of that happening were always this big, right? You know, so now there's a great ruckus. And now the finger pointing begins and the blaming and the shaming and <sighs> dogs and cats living together. <laughs> Because I don't think everybody knows yeah. what the background to this is. Okay, to what? Star Trek or the Star Trek. Star Trek. Oh, yeah, Star Trek. <laughs> okay. We all know about Brexit. So who here, who here doesn't know that I wrote for Star Trek? <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm in possession of a strange distinction. At this moment in time, I am the one person on Earth who has written for Star Trek in the most forms of media, uh, which is kind of bizarre, but no. yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just strange. I, I looked at it one day and I said, you know, wh what have I done here? So you figure, okay, novels. Right. That's how it started. And then comics and then manga and then uh, audio recording and then very late in the preceding television. Um, I think sort of the only way that Trek can be written for that I haven't done is film. And that's not going to happen. And that's fine with me. <laughs> There's too much baggage associated with writing Star Trek movies. You, uh, part of it, you know, you have to be the hottest thing in film since sliced bread. And that would not be me right now. And you know what? I don't want to be that. I like being here. And the difficulty is that to be the hottest thing in sliced bread in film, you pretty much have to live in Los Angeles. I did that. They let me out of the barrel, okay? <laughs> that was, you know, I did my time in the barrel, and, and then I escaped. Um, I mean, and I, I, I take escaped, you know, to have certain stronger than usual values. I mean, guys, I wrote a Star Trek novel on my honeymoon. <laughs> with my husband. <laughs> And if that doesn't test a relationship, I'm sure I don't know what will. <laughs> and it was fine. The only really annoying thing about it 
was that he aced my style, this sucker. <laughs> I just wanted to teach him, right? You know, it. Because you like to think, you like to think you have your own writing style. I mean, and granted, I have a number of them. I, I have a particular style that works in the Young Wizards universe, and so I'm over there with that. I have a particular style that I use for adult fantasy. That's fine. Star Trek is more problematic in that your job, when you're dealing in a shared universe, and Star Trek is a shared universe, is you want to stay out of its way as much as you can. Your job is to make the characters look good and to not interfere with them more than you have to. And so there's a particular tone of voice that you cultivate for that. And so I cultivated that voice, and that was fine. And then they came to me and they said, well, you know, why don't you do another of these books? I said, fine, I'll do that. And then they said, well, why don't you do another Romulan book? I'm going, fine, I'll do that. And I, you know, did the usual thing. The way you pitch to a big licensed, you know, license holder like this is, or was certainly, I don't think this has changed much. You send them an outline. And you say, this is what I'm going to do with the understanding that you never, ever play fast and loose with that outline. If you say you're going to do this thing, you do it. And, and that's the way it is. It's cast in stone. So I sent them the outline and that was fine. And they said, OK, no problem. Write the book. And then an old friend from L.A. called me. I was living in Philly at the time. And he said, I need you to come out and be story editor on this animated series I'm doing. And I said, okay, um, fine. When do you anticipate the funding will come through? Because there's always a, a timing issue with a new cartoon series or indeed a new live action series. You need to know when the co-production partners are all going to throw their money into the pot. And this is called clearances. I said, so when are the clearances coming through? He said, we think November looks like November. I said, good, that, that, that's fine. So I signed on with this thing while working on this book. And then the clearances didn't actually come through until March of the following year, which meant that I had to start work. My, my, you know, I and my later co-story editor, Bryn Stevens, were going to have to produce 65 half hours in four months. Okay, this is not easy. And Bryn and I had a chat. We said, look, we did not sign up for this. Um, it's not in our contracts. They can't make us do it. Nonetheless, we both took this work on. This is a matter of honor. And we are, between us, right now, the two major female story editors in, in Hollywood. And it was kind of a big deal at that point. Up until then, I, I should qualify that, animation story editors. And until then, there had not been a female story editor who was managing an adventure story by herself. There was always a guy holding her hand, right? And because obviously girls can't write adventure. <laughs> that should have been whiskey for that. Anyway, so... <laughs> I said to Bryn, I said to Bryn, look, we don't have to do this. They can't hold us to it. But this is an honor thing, because if we back away from this, every woman who comes into this business for the next 20 years is going to be stigmatized by it. Because when this challenge was thrown up in our faces, we backed away and, and we looked at each other and said, nah, I said to Bryn, and you know that it's really going to piss the boys off <laughs> a lot. She said, yeah, bring it, you know. So we were good with that. That That's how that went. And for the next four months, she and I and her assistant, Lydia Morano, came on to work with us. We produced 65 half hours of animation. No male story editor had ever done anything of the like in the history of Hollywood animation. And you know what? Neither of us has ever been hired back to work there since. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> it's just one of those things. But, you know, th there comes a moment where you can see the path laid out in front of you. You know exactly how it's going to play out. And you say, 
screw it. We said we were going to do this thing. So fine, we did it. While this is going on, the book that will eventually become the Romulan way is getting later and later and later. And finally, my agent, the long suffering Don Moss, who is an angel, he is going straight to heaven just for dealing with me, let alone all his other clients. Don called Peter. Now, we had a strange relationship at that point. Uh, what do I mean at that point? Um, and I speak of Peter and me. When we got married, we gave each other literary agencies as wedding presents. Okay? <laughs> so he was then with an agency called MBA in London, and I was with Don Moss. I was, I, if I wasn't actually Don's first client, I was very close, very near. So each of us gave the other one their agency as, as a wedding gift, and that was fine. Don calls Peter up and says, look, uh, I see that Diane is kind of um, fraught at the moment. <laughs> you know, she's stretched, stretched a bit thin with this animation thing because she can't help it. It's just where she is right now. And Peter said, yeah, that's true. And, and Don says, well, would you ever do something? Help your damn wife. <laughs> and, you know, Peter said, yes, of course. Let me just go up and, you know, clear that with the boss. So, so we did. And I said to him, all right, look, the outline is very clear. And whatever they will say about me, maybe this really needs to be engraved on my, on my you know, gravestone, wherever it may be. She gave good outline. <laughs> I think the best outline we've ever seen. My outlines are fucking brilliant. I'm sorry. They are. <laughs> and... And I learned this from animation because Tom Swale and his co, you know, uh, story editor, Dwayne Poole, um, taught me how to write a coherent outline. You must understand that the rules for animation writing were then, when I, when I started in, different from the way uh, writers pitch to live action now. It was all done in writing. So that when you go in to pitch to a live action editor, a story editor, or you know, head of story. Back in the days when this still happened, when it didn't all happen in the room, as we must now call it, um, when they actually brought writers in from outside and said, here, we, we like the premise that you sent us. You would send them a one-page premise, all right? And then they would say to you, okay, good, come in and talk to us about that. And you would pitch your story at more length and then they'd either say, you know, thank you, you'll be hearing from us, which meant no, <laughs> you know, jump in a ditch now. <laughs> or uh, they said, have your agent call us, which meant yes, which was always good. That was live action. Animation, because so many more people were involved and they were scattered all the hell over the place. Um, you could pitch in writing. So you would, you know, write out that one page premise and then having been invited to amplify that, you would do then uh, a mini outline. You would think of it as now sort of eight pages spelling out where the, the story was going. So that's how that would go. And Peter came into this process rather late, uh, but he knew what an outline was. And he knew the way I broke them out. And, and you must understand that, that when I'm writing a novel outline, it partakes of what I learned from animation, but is routinely much more detailed. So there would be times, uh, you know, looking, for example, at one of the Young Wizards books, the outline would routinely be 50 or 60 pages long because I like to beat it out. I like to make sure that I know everything that's happening or is likely to happen um, cause again, it's a given around here. I am not one of those writers who lets their characters rampage around the landscape running shit. <laughs> we do not do that in my universe. We have structure. There's too bloody much chaos. I have no patience with chaos, especially in, in at the storytelling level. You know, chaos is everywhere. Oh, it's raining again. That's exciting. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm using raining in the sense of absolutely pissing down stair rods. You know, it, 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 
Don't even let's never mind. Please God, it will stop soon. But anyway, so to say that I had a very complete outline on the Romulan way would be understating matters rather. Um, in particular, because when you pitched a trek at that point, you needed to give them a very clear sense of exactly what you were going to be doing. And and I'd been with them long enough that they knew that the outline I gave them was exactly the way it was going to go. Um, when you're dealing with a big licensor like them or Marvel or Tom Clancy or any of these people, you don't pay, play fast and loose with the outline. If, if you think you see a plot change coming that you didn't anticipate, you call your editor and you say, I think this thing here isn't working. And I need you to talk to whoever it would be at the license or and sort this out and see if this is going to be a problem. You don't spring surprises on your license or this is not kind. So in any case, I had a very complete outline and I handed this to Peter and I said, look, you see where we're going with this? He read it. It was about 30, might've been 40 pages and change. And he says, yeah, I see that. No problem. So, what we would do would be this. I would get up in the morning. I would get in the car and I would drive down to Deke to the studio in Encino where, where my office was. I would work with the writers who came to see me that day. While I was doing that, Peter would be writing the next bit that it was his job to write. I would then come home from work, five, six, seven o'clock, God knows what. I would read what he had written, and then I would pick up from there and write until midnight, one, two in the morning. And then I would fall over, and he would read what I had written, and maybe we'd be in the same bed, and maybe we wouldn't. We then, as now, did a practice which in most navies of the world is called hot bunking, <laughs> where bed you get into may not be cold from the body of the person who just left it. <laughs> and so we did that. And we wrote a, a novel. We wrote a 90,000 word novel in 16 or 18 days, it might have been. <laughs> While I was also working. And there may have been sex. <laughs> so have been sex there somewhere and I'm not talking about the book so this is why it is quite funny when later on somebody associated with the Star Trek offices attempted to claim that this outline was something for another book that I had written somewhere else and I had like just scraped my own characters off it and applied Star Trek characters to <laughs> And I sort of went, <laughs> yeah, right. And in particular, people like that should really not make statements of the kind when you have a paper trail that shows you submitting that complete outline with all the characters in place to Paramount for, you know, approval two years previously. It's like, can, could I be arsed to plot against your sorry butt for two years and then get married and miss out on all this sex I could have been having. <laughs> I'm there for a minute, so let me just, okay. Anyway, we'll get, you see how it is. So Peter walks into this situation, sits down, and under a situation of tremendous stress, produces pitch-perfect, seamless Star Trek to the point where most people who read that book cannot tell which bits I wrote and which bits he wrote. <laughs> and don't imagine I'm going to tell you either. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. You know, they're sealed. Um, but he's really good. And, it, you know, there comes a level where you have to admire the sheer professionalism of, of the writer you married and say, God, God, he did brilliantly under really, really stupid conditions. 
who would dare throw another human being into that? And the rest of me is going, bastard, bastard. (laughs) How dare you mimic my style so closely? How can you do this? But we don't, let, we, we don't let him see those little fits of temper. We, we don't. He is so good at what he does. And when we went on to do more television work together, it was such a virtue and such an accomplishment on his part that no one could tell which of us was writing what. And that's just the way it should be. When you are writing as a corporate entity, when you are writing as Peter Morwood and Diane Duane, um, no one should be able to tell. That's the way it ought to go. So that's how that Star Trek novel went. Uh, the episode was another story. And as I say, you have to pitch to the face of the people you're working with. And that is a different story. My uh, co-writer on that, Michael Reeves, uh, who is Brynn Stevens' husband, or was at, at that point, excuse me, um, he, we were living in their house at this point, you know, before, previous to moving over here. And Michael came to me one morning, um, about a month after Next Generation was announced, at which point everyone in Hollywood immediately began writing a Star Trek script because, because, <laughs> why wouldn't you? And Michael came to me over breakfast and he said, look, I keep trying to generate a story idea for this and everything I do keeps coming out looking like The Wounded Sky, which was my first Star Trek novel. He says, so do you want to come and pitch with me to the office? And I went, you know, what part of, oh God, yes, do you not understand? Um, it was an incredibly generous offer because at that point they were not accepting pitches from people who did not have Writers Guild credential. And at that point, you could have done 8 million episodes of Scooby-Doo, but that would not have gotten you one point's worth of credential with the Writers Guild. Now things have changed. The Guild has taken animation under its wing, and those of us who did all that work, you know, for Scooby and Captain Caveman, and the, believe this or not, I bet none of you have ever seen this. The animated Laverne and Shirley. (laughs) It exists, I swear to God. Um, And, you know, Space Ghost and Space Stars and Biscuits and all these other bizarre things I wrote to to feed the cats and keep keep my breath in my body. Um, Those you now get paid for. And it's kind of magical that twice a year a check arrives from the Writers Guild, and it has foreign sales for all these things. You know, you had a thing that appears in the Flintstones Comedy Hour as it's being shown in Serbia, (laughs) you know. And you get, you know, you get 20 or 30 bucks or 100 bucks from that. Who is to argue? This is cat food, right? You know, my cat thank Hanna-Barbera or, you know, while they were on life, we're, we're, we're catless at the moment, but that won't last for long. <laughs> and, and so that's how that went. But when you go to pitch to real people, you know, to a live action drama in Hollywood, it works rather differently. You go and see the people themselves. And Michael, uh, you know, came to me and, and said, why do we do this together? I said, fine, let's do this, you know, because you've got Writers Guild Guild credential. He had actually done the live action work at that point. So we sat down and we wrote this thing together. It took us maybe two weeks. It wasn't hard. I mean, you know, once he said, is it okay if we cannibalize the wounded sky? Yes, take it. Let's, let's, let's roll. Uh, And we submitted it to the Trek offices and we got a call back saying, come in and pitch to Gene. At which point, I'm afraid my brain sort of fell out on the floor <laughs> and, and had to be kind of scraped up into a little heap and, and shoved back in my head. I said, Michael, how do you do this? He says, breathe. He's just another producer. <laughs> I said, 
did God hear you say that? <laughs> because, you know, it was, it was not true, really, really. But he'd been there and he, you know, he knew how to do this. So we went in and we pitched. Now, it must be said that I had met Gene Roddenberry numerous times before. Um, in particular, the time at one of the great New York conventions in 1974, when I was acting as informal nursing staff to the convention, uh, and Gene and Majel had a dealer's table there, and it was being managed by a lady who was an acquaintance of theirs. Somebody broke into uh, their hotel room that night, uh, or the, the ladies' hotel room that night, uh, with an eye to stealing what they thought was in the Roddenberry's cash box, which they figured was in that room. This poor woman was beaten up badly. The police were called in, and I know, it, it's really upsetting. And, and so, uh, since I was medical staff, as it were, on site, I went straight in and started mopping the blood off her and checking her out. It's at this point that the New York police arrive, and find it a little strange that this lady is being medically dealt with, you know, in, in a nursing sort of way, by a very slender platinum blonde young woman wearing a two-piece thing from Fredericks of Hollywood. <laughs> it, was it was costume night. <laughs> you know, it was, it's not like I was badly dressed or anything. It was, it was a rather modest kind of over-the-shoulder thing that tied in, in front of the bus, and then there was a low-slung, you know, slit right up to the, the hip kind of uh, wrap around the hips. And the cops come in and begin ogling me. <laughs> and they say, who are you actually? <laughs> so I say, I'm actually the nurse on duty here, actually. This is what's wrong with you, this lady, actually. And you should call a fucking ambulance, actually. <laughs> they were kind of stunned. <laughs> they were not used to being given lip by platinum blondes of, you know, about 22 years of age in clothes from Fredericks of Hollywood. Nonetheless, they got their butts under them and got the ambulance there, and that was fine. And I spent about another three hours in the emergency room at Lenox Hill Hospital with Jean and Majel while their friend was being treated, just talking stuff to them, everything that was not Star Trek, because frankly, um, I think that was sort of the last thing they want to hear about at that point. And it was charming. And my thought as... Michael and I sat in Jean's office was this, and it kind of crept in from the side and it derailed me for a good 30 seconds at one point. Has he made the connection between the girl in the Fredericks of Hollywood thing <laughs> and the woman who's sitting in front of him right now? <laughs> I don't think he had, so that was okay, but... You can imagine how that, that thought sort of creeping across your forebrain would actually bring you to a screaming halt. Uh, and it did. But anyway, we pitched it, and what was very, very charming was that, was it Bob, Bob Foreman, I think? Um, one of the old school Trek people who had worked with Gene on the first series said about what Michael and I were pitching to him, this is the Star Trekiest Star Trek story I have ever heard. <laughs> and I sort of like, yeah, it was, there's no possible response. There's no response to that. So fine. So that sounds really positive, doesn't it? And then shit starts to happen. Okay, because en entropy is in fact running. So we, we pitch. You know, we've, we've done our pitch now. Uh, Gene's office now needs um, a full treatment, as we call it. So, you know, broken out shot by shot as the episode will, will unfold. So Michael and I spend 
about a week and a half, breaking it out shot by shot for treatment. We come in, having submitted the thing, it's fine. We have notes. You know, there are always notes. You must understand that note, notes are what happen, you know, when, when your perfectly shaped premise or treatment comes in contact with the, the outside world and producers. And there are often lots and lots and lots of people who give you notes and, and your job as a writer is to figure out which ones to pay attention to. Uh, your job mostly is to look to see who of all the people who gave you notes has spent the most on this, and theirs are the notes you pay attention to. <laughs> so that's fine. So at this point, it was straightforward. You know, notes came down from Gene's office. We said, okay, this we can do, this we can do, this we can do, this, where the hell did that come? What do we do with that? I don't know, push it over to the side. Maybe they'll forget about it, because sometimes they do. Sometimes people give you notes just to prove that they have a reason to meddle in your life. All right. And some of them will mean more than others. So your job is to figure out which of these notes are really important to the person who gave them to you and pay attention to the ones that are really important and pay less attention to the ones that are sort of only a bit important and pay no attention at all, if you can, to those which are total bullshit. <laughs> and your job is to determine which is which in this case. So we turned our revised treatment in sort of about two weeks later. Everything was fine. They said, go to script. Okay. It took us, and, and one of the reasons that script deals are structured this way is to make it easy for the writer to work. A little bit of work at first, more detailed work at second, you know, then third stage is quite detailed story material. So by that point, you should have very, very little difficulty actually writing your script. And since Michael and I had been around the block many times in this way, it took us approximately two weeks, two and a half weeks to write the completed script that we submitted. And we submitted it. And that was fine. And the checks cleared and his family and my family went over to England for a holiday because it was Worldcon in, Bris in Brighton that year, the first, the first of the Brighton Worldcons. So we all went over together. We rented a big house in the Midlands. We invited all the friends in the UK who had come to visit us while we were in the States or in Ireland. And we had a more or less six-week house party bracketed around the Worldcon. And it was charming. David Brin leaned on our Aga stove and attempted to explain to Peter's mother how women's elbows were shaped differently than men's elbows so they could carry babies. <laughs> I saw Peter's mother look at Brin, who was like on the other side of the stove, and they made a set of gestures of which David was completely, completely unaware where Peter's mother mimed picking up one of the big, heavy, heat-insulating lids of the Aga stove, and Bryn mimed putting David's head down on it and closing the lid. <laughs> on the boiling plate. He never, he never saw, he never noticed. We let him live, you know, it wasn't his fault. He, he had a new girlfriend at that point and his brains were scrambled. Anyway, so many people wandered in and out of the household. And during this period came the word that we had been cut off at first draft on the Trek episode. Now this happens, you know, sometimes, and it, I, I did this to people occasionally when I was working on dinosaurs and you don't like to do it, but it occasionally happens. You're in a situation where you know that if you send the script back to the person for the changes you are sure it's going to need, it's going to take them a long time to get it done. There's going to be a lot of craziness. You just don't do it. So you thank them. You give them their first draft payment. They're cut off at that. First draft at that point for, for a Star Trek episode was $14,000. You would not, you know, you, you'd bend over in the street to pick it up. You know, at the same time, you would have had more if you'd gone to second draft. You'd, you know, you'd have more if you went on to polish, but them's the breaks. It happens. Grown-ups take a deep breath, say, the first check cleared, our names will be on the credits, everything will be fine, and you move on. Well then, what we were not clear about at that stage and what did not become clear 
for quite a while thereafter was that the next generation offices were in the beginning of what would prove to be a long, long firestorm. As usual, when you drop money onto a property, everyone gets interested. When you drop lots of money onto a property, everyone gets very interested. And the in-house staff starts squabbling over control. Now, since David Gerald had brought Michael and me in, because we were both friends of his, and there was a putsch going on, and David was being thrown out the door. All the writers he had brought in were also being thrown out the door, and that was us. Okay. And then comes even more of the entropy, because, again, a lot of this stuff is only now surfacing. Tr scripts were being rewritten by someone who had no authority to do this. All right. It was... Gene's lawyer who had decided that he wanted to pick up some of this easy writer money by becoming a writer himself. I put the word in air quotes for him. Uh, and our script was one of those that fell prey to this. Leaving aside easily Three quarters of an hour of bar story, I could tell you about everything that happened in the office at that point. And I think the high, the high point of it would be the giant roll of butcher paper, which I think is still in the possession of Ron Moore, who has gone on to much, much better things, um, which had the signature on it, the autograph of it, on, of every staff writer who passed through the office during that period. And there were like 60 of them. All right. Trek TNG got a reputation for being the least stable place to work in Hollywood. That is why they threw um, the door open to fan submissions. And here is one of those strange things. If it were not for the, the complete garbage fire that the office had become, become, become at that point, we would not have Ron Moore, who went on to Battlestar Galactica and now Outlander, as, as we know. So it would be wrong to say that this ill wind did not blow anybody any good, but for those of us who were caught in the middle of it, so our script was one of many that got caught in this firestorm and was rewritten horrifically um, by, uh, I won't say his name, anybody who wants to go find it can find it. Um, but it got used as an excuse for them theoretically to fire him later because he took three times as long to rewrite the script as we took to write it. <laughs> this gains a certain piquancy when you understand that the reason that was given us for us being cut off at first draft was time considerations. <laughs> they were all right. So anyway, um, in our, you know, the holiday house that we had rented in the UK, Michael and I put our heads together and, and looked at the question of whether or not we should take our names off the draft. The Guild allows you to do that. If you feel that your script has been savaged in such a way that it is no longer recognizable as what you wrote, then you're within your rights. You may use a pseudonym that is, is not overtly obscene or annoying. It's like Alan Smithy that directors use. And the problem is we got so busy, you know, coming up with interesting possible pseudonyms <laughs> that by the time we both liked, the thing was already in the can and had gone to distribution. <laughs> Such and such. That's okay, because what that means is when the thing was put up for any consideration, it's our names that were on it and not the name of the person who rewrote it. Who rewrote it so thoroughly that of our original script, there remains only one shot and one scene. <laughs> The scene is Michael's, uh, the scene where Picard in this sort of otherworldly, you know, dream or experiential state meets up with his mother. That is Michael's. The single shot of the turbolift lift going up and Picard getting ready to 
walk out and then grabbing the sides of the turbo lift and going, oh, fuck, because there's nothing but open space out there that's mine. <laughs> that is that is me stealing so unsubtly from the door into starlight, going, look, here it is. I haven't written it yet, but it's here. <laughs> you know, and that's it. That's all that was left of what we did. Yet, you know, the checks cleared <laughs> for what we did. And this is what life in Hollywood is like. One girds one's loins and strides into the fray, understanding that even for shows, you know, that are properties you've loved since your teens, um, they may treat you in ways that would break lesser beings. Uh, one of the things that you learn very quickly if you're going to be a television writer is the so-called my every word is golden um, thing that the novelists are supposed to get into. You get to kiss that goodbye real quick. Um, I learned to rewrite at high speed and to let go of what I had done and do the next thing specifically from Tom Swale and Dwayne Poole, who were my story editors on Scooby-Doo, Captain Caveman, the animated Laverne and Shirley, and so on down the line. Uh, they showed me how professionals did it. You don't stand around weeping and wailing and gnashing your teeth and rending your garments when the people who are going to pay you say, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't work for us today. You say, fine, what does work? And you write something else. And ideally, by 3.30 this afternoon. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Um, when I went on later to do some development work at Filmation under Lou Scheimer, God rest him, he's gone now, but a brilliant and funny producer. Um, I was working with the guy who hired me on later at Deke, um, Robbie. Um, I can't forget Robbie's last name. That's intensely stupid of me. Anyway, Robbie, we'll call him for the moment. And, and with Paul Dini, who was working with him on He-Man. All right. Uh, this was the first, the first uh, incarnation of He-Man as an animation. It was brilliant. We were having so much fun. We had a Castle Grayskull in our story editor's office, right? Art Nadell, another great name, another educator of young animators. Joe Straczynski worked under him. Pretty much everybody who's anybody in Hollywood at now had at least a brush with Arthur Nadell as, as a brilliant story editor. So we had in Art's office a Castle Grayskull, and every morning, yes, I, thank you, I got that. Um, why does the Skype logo have a mustache on it? <laughs> uh, because I'm just a floating mustache and not much else. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, just, I was wondering. I was seeing that earlier. Anyway, so we had this Castle Grayskull, and every morning we would sneak into Arthur's office before he was there and put all the figures in obscene positions. <laughs> And so, you know, He-Man would be going down on Man at Arms, who would be screwing Battle Cat. And, just, and you know, She-Ra would be standing off to one side going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was quite brilliant. And all of us were working together at that point. Um, I'm going to remember how to hook that up to Star Trek now in a moment. Don't, don't wait. Don't wait. Uh, it, it's just these, these things happen uh, generationally there has been such a wonderful connection between people who would come in and teach you how to do your job um, and then keep you doing it keep you able to keep doing it uh, animation in particular in that in that generation was very very interconnected um, it's it's not quite as connected now because We've been seeing in, in live action and animation uh, a, cer a certain partitioning where you have your room and, you know, those people who you've hired in, uh, they're the only ones who get to touch story anymore. I, I can't help but feel a little bit sorry for the time when you could commission writers independently where you would say, I want you to write this story and you would send them off and two weeks later they bring it in for you. And then you would work on it together rather than having everything be ruthlessly break, broken down in the room by the same people all the time. You know, stuff changes. Uh, stuff changes even now. I mean, we're, we're looking at 
what Trek has just come down and said is it's going to permit in, in terms of fan film production. It's really interesting to see that there is nothing anywhere in that statement about fan writing. It's fabulous to notice, you know, it's both, in a way, sad that that's fallen under the radar because God knows that's where I got my start. I was writing Trek fanfic 20 years before it ever occurred to me that I would be writing Trek profic. <laughs> and and so, strange, strange, you know, career arc, uh, but a really satisfying one. It, it, it's so delightful to be able to give something back to the thing that really got you started seriously writing, at least for yourself. Um, and, you know, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, is there time for a question or two before we have to kill this? Yes, we can take perhaps two or three questions. Does that okay, let's go. sound good? Okay, who's got a question? I've got one. Um, when you started this uh, conversation, you said that Paramount had done something stupid, and you never explained what they <laughs> was. <laughs> well, essentially what they've done is hamstring every single present video or film production that, that's working right now. Now, uh, they can't really help it. They have to take a stand. Legally, you are required to protect your copyright. Otherwise, it is not your copyright anymore. They don't dare lose it. They really don't. Um, they have been, I think, a bit more um, draconian than they need to be. We can see what this is pointed at. We can see that this is pointed at Axonar who overstepped, made too much money. Because until now, the rule has always been, if you make money, it has to be an amount small enough not to upset the copyright holder. Well, they stepped over that line by design or intent or accident. They stepped over it, and now everyone else who's doing fan video, fan film, is going to suffer as a result. Um, you do not kick... The copyright holder, you know, this, it's the King Log, King Stork story all over again. Now, the Paramount, are they overreacting? I think maybe so. Oh, no. no. It's frozen. <laughs> she will probably unfreeze in a moment. Yeah. But. Too far. Oh, there we go. We'll have to see how this plays out. We'll have to see how it plays out. Okay, are we good? Yeah. yeah. That's good. Well, Oh, no, okay, you're still here. That's actually perfect because, because my phone actually told me that it's running out of, of power. So let, let's, let's complete this quickly. Anybody else? What, what do we got? One over, one, what? One over here. Me? Yes. Okay. Um, what's your bacon number? <laughs> what? Bacon what? number. My what? Your bacon number. How uh, many degrees are you from Kevin Bacon? <laughs> this, I, I may have to. I may have to continue this story tomorrow. Well, remind me. Somebody remind me to talk about taking Peter to Worldcon in the Hague and going to the lovely breakfast buffet in the vast room, which I think was normally a ballroom in, in the hotel in The Hague, where they had giant catering things full of crispy bacon. <laughs> <laughs> that tall, that wide, that deep, full of bacon. Peter had gone back for his fifth plate. I've maybe had a couple, all right? His fifth plate. And the editor, Beth Meacham at Tor, as, as was and then, then is now, said to me, don't you feed him at home? I said, at home I feed him. Here it's their problem. <laughs> so I could have a bacon number just by standing next to him. <laughs> All right? I don't know if I have one of my own. If, do they have like cooperative or group bacon numbers? That would, that would be the answer. It's probably well up. It, it's got exponents. All right? Bacon. <laughs> don't get me started. Okay. Talk about We'll talk about Speck from Switzerland tomorrow. What else we got? <laughs> so one more. Do we have anybody on the other side of the room that I have not seen? No. Okay. I don't have a back. question, but 
but I did want to say thank you for writing some episodes of Gargoyles. Yes. <laughs> that also is Michael Reeves' fault, because he, he brought us in to do that when he was working at Warner. And, and Paul Dini was there as well. Robbie London, Robbie London. Um, I mean, how can I forget the name of the man who married me? I, I don't mean married me in the, in the active sense, in the passive sense. Uh, Robbie, Robbie, like me, is a minister of the Universal Life Church. Now, when Peter and I were, get ready, were ready to get married, it seemed like an error for, us to, for me to actually marry us. I, I thought maybe there should be someone else involved. You know, so we said to Robbie, Robbie, would you marry us? He said, sure, no problem. So that marriage, that wedding was held in Michael Reeves and Bryn Stevens' house at that point uh, with just the family looking on and, and Robbie. So my, you know, my marriage certificate in, in California is signed by the vice president for creative shit at Deke Productions. <laughs> Why not? He's a minister. It counts, right? And then we did it again. Um, in Boston the following week after all the blood tests and crap had been handled. And that time, Ed Bryant, the science fiction writer, married us. Ed is very good. He married Harlan Ellison to Sue. They stuck together that long. We said, this is a fair bet. You know, <laughs> you'll be fine. So, so that's uh, how that went. If we can keep it down to, like, absolutely, like, one minute per question, we can take maybe two more questions. One here. Okay. And if I... If, if I if I run away suddenly, it's because my phone died. So let's go. Okay. Um, the library in the first book, based on, you know, the library that she finds the book, was that like your childhood library? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it was. It was a house. It was a house that had been converted. It has since been replaced by a larger, shinier building, but. Uh, that was yeah. my childhood library, too, and I've met a lot of people that have the same experience. And I just want to say thank you for bringing that So up. many of us. So many. Okay, in the back, super fast. What was the TV show that you did the 64 episodes on in a short amount of time? Did you hear that? Dinosaurs. Oh, there okay. you go. Yes. Great. Um, as a Long Islander, I have to say thank you for setting Young Wizards in my neck of the woods. <laughs> Such, are you kidding? <laughs> Write what you know. <laughs> Make up the rest. An absolute last. Um, just thank you. I. I've had the Star Trek comics for a long time, and I never thought I would love a story about a bunch of heavily armed cats taking over the Excelsior. <laughs> okay. I like the thing to do at the time. <laughs> and on that note, I know there are more questions. We do have a full Q&A session that it is just Diane answering your question. That's all it is. It will be a whole hour. It will be tomorrow. We love you. See you later, guys. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Go charge your phone. Bye now. Have a good. <laughs> bye.